Welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm Jenna Miller. Physical therapists are movement experts who improve quality of life through hands-on care, patient education, and prescribed movement. Physical therapists and physical therapist assistants help you maximize your movement, manage pain, avoid surgery and prescription drugs, manage chronic, otherwise long-term conditions, and recover from and prevent injury. Regular physical therapy can benefit your physical, mental, and social health. It also helps to prevent or improve many chronic conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and some cancers. How important is nutrition to fulfilling your goals of health and wellness? We'll dis be discussing these topics and more with our guest, Dr. Amy Regal. presentation of Doctors on Call on Smoky Hills PBS is made possible in part by an underwriting grant from Coastal Regional Hospital, experts, neighbors, friends. Our team at Smith County Memorial Hospital is always striving to exceed expectations of our patients and guests. Your family is our family. Physical therapy, nutrition, and wellness are the topics this evening on Doctors on Call. Dr. Amy Regal, PT, DPT, is a graduate of the University of Kansas with a Bachelor of Science in Education with an emphasis in exercise science. She attended the University of Kansas Medical Center Physical Therapy Program where she received her Doctor of Physical Therapy degree in 2007. She has practiced outpatient orthopedics her entire career, spending six years in northeastern Kansas where she served as the director of a small outpatient clinic before relocating to western Kansas in 2013. Amy founded Fit Pit PT and Wellness LLC in September 2019, a cash-based concierge <laughs> practice, which she expanded to include a group fitness studio in October of 2020. Amy specializes in functional dry needling and is a level two dry needling practitioner. Amy also teaches virtual and in-person individual and group fitness programming and offers specialty fitness and health workshops to businesses and organizations both locally and on a national level to increase awareness of health and wellness for all ages. Amy recently became a certified functional nutrition informed professional in October of 2023. Doctors on Call brings you information which may be useful to you when you see your own physician or physical therapist. While the first calls come in, we'll go ahead and start with some questions of our own. Thank you so much for joining us this Thank evening. You. We're really Thanks excited to have me. you. Very Absolutely. Here. Okay, let's first talk about how do you know if physical therapy is something that you should try? Right. So I think this is a great question to start out with because I feel that so many um, consumers of healthcare don't actually know um, despite us having direct access to physical therapy since 2013 here in Kansas, many people don't understand they can go to a physical therapist without a physician's prescription. So it's really nice um, for individuals who maybe have an ache or pain or they're struggling with an injury or headaches. Um, any musculoskeletal type problem that you might experience is always a great way to get in the, to see a physical therapist first um, because we can really tease out those issues earlier on and get, save you some money um, in the long run with your healthcare dollars. Um, and that's always a nice thing is getting and feeling better sooner as well. Um, and so, yes, uh, anyone who's struggling with musculoskeletal problems, um, nerve pain, overuse injuries, those are all things that we see. We do treat a lot of things actually. Sure. And how do you go about finding a physical therapist that's right so, for you? So um, nationally, we have this really wonderful registry through the American Phys Physical Therapy Association. Um, there's a website called choosept.com. Individuals can go to that website and they're able to seek out uh, PTs in their area. So they can type in their zip code or location and find PTs through that registry. Um, oftentimes in your local communities, um, your chamber of commerce may have insight to that or Google is oftentimes how I am found um, by, you know, closest uh, physical therapist uh, to, you know, my area or something like that. So, um, but those are the most easy ways. You can also ask your insurance company to, um, if you are looking to go through insurance to find a physical therapist. Excellent. Now, what is the difference between a physical therapist and a physical therapist assistant? Good question. So uh, physical therapist, we actually um, go through and have our doctorate. Uh, now it's a doctorate training program, trained program. Um, and we actually will assess and evaluate the patient and determine the course of treatment required. Um, an assistant is one who is able to carry out that plan of care that is set forth by the PT. Um, they work directly under our license and are a wonderful adjunct to our um, skills and help us to, to manage our patients um, in certain um, instances. 
All right, very interesting. How do you diet, uh, how do you assess and diagnose a plan of treatment for a patient? So personally, for me, um, and throughout my years of working in outpatient orthopedics, uh, I you know take a thorough examination of the patient. We take a very thorough subjective exam, get lots of information as to what might be going on, and then come up with um, uh, an assessment uh, based upon what the patients are telling us do a full examination. A lot of it is just watching somebody move. I can tell a lot from watching someone walk, um, wa watching someone um, bend over or squat, do their functional activities. Oftentimes people come in and it's something that they've done because of their job. So for example, sitting at a desk all day long, I'm like, well, why don't you go ahead and sit here and let me see what that looks like. So putting them in a functional aspect and kind of saying, oh yeah, I can really see here what's going on. Um, that allows us to pr appropriately treat and dose what it might be that we need to do for that patient. Um, so for my own personal needs, I usually spend about an hour and 15 minutes with my clients one-on-one -on -one for that full time to really get a good understanding of what's going on. And then we can treat them that same day and get them feeling better before they leave. Sure. Now, oftentimes a person has surgery Correct. and then they have to go see a physical therapist right, for a little right. while after. Mm -hmm. However, you hear that sometimes you can prevent surgery as well. Explain that. That is true. So a lot of um, common conditions, you know, carpal tunnel, um, patellofemoral pain, even like serious conditions such as like a rotator cuff tear, um, a lot of individuals think that they, you know, they need to have surgery to fix these issues. Um, and oftentimes, you know, a, a surgeon won't actually allow that to happen. They'll want them to go through the conservative treatment required first so that they can actually ensure that they have done those steps to ensure, yes, definitely that did not work. Surgery is um, indicated at that point. But a lot of times like, I've seen these people who have um, been able to recover from like a disc herniation and things that, you know, yes, can they be surgically corrected? Of course they can. Um, however, PT can also help that for individuals who are maybe, you know, wanting to avoid surgery. And I see a lot of individuals who say, I just don't have the time to go through surgery. Um, you know, it's too much of a commitment, and so they really are looking to avoid that. And so PT can help that to an extent. Now, there's oftentimes where it definitely they are a surgical candidate for serious things. But yeah, um, we're finding, um, you know, throughout research in uh, healthcare, we're seeing a lot of interesting things showing up. Um, yes, yeah, like even ACL tears sometimes, if they're not like a competitive athlete, they don't have to run out and get things like that fixed. Um, they can definitely strengthen in a way to help them um, accommodate and um avoid having to have surgery. Sure. Now, how many visits are required for treatment? So that is totally dependent on the patient. Um, I have individuals that I'll see one time. Um, I have individuals that I might see, you know, 50 times. It just totally depends on the specific case, um, the, you know, chronicity of their uh, individual um, problem that they have been experiencing. And it also depends on kind of the care um, and the clinic that they might be uh, going to. For example, I work outside of the insurance world, so I have decided to work out a network with insurance. So I don't typically see my patients as often as someone in an insurance-based setting where it would. Um, typically, course of care, like for a post-op, you're gonna see your physical therapist maybe twice to three times a week, um, whereas if I'm seeing someone, I might see them once a week um, or twice a month. Um, just because I want to, you know, uh, give them more value and just give patients a lot of education and what they can do on their own. So the, my care looks a little bit different than your traditional physical therapy is what most might think. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's totally subject or totally depends on the evaluation process. And that's where that PT decides, here's how many visits I think it's going to take you to get from A to B. Um, and that really is so different for each person. Sure. Now, how important is it for a patient to leave your office and do what you've told them to do. <laughs> um, it is very important, actually. Uh, I find that my patients who come to me and pay out of their own pocket are very um, motivated to do so. Um, and when they come back to me, uh, it's really exciting to see, to recheck them and say, oh my gosh, I can tell you've been doing your homework or they're just flat out honest with me, like I haven't done anything. And I'm like, well, I'll be able to tell if you haven't um, because we're not seeing the progress that you might see otherwise if they were being consistent with their home program. Um, so yes, it is very important. Um, we don't just dose exercises and give those out for fun. Um, it is for benefit. And so we do appreciate that our patients follow through on that care. And those are things that we really want them to do for a lifetime. I think some of the uh, misconceptions are, you know, I've done this exercise program. I feel better. My painful event has came to an end. So they stopped doing those exercises. And we'll talk about exercise a little bit later and how important it is. Um, but, you know, exercise is, is meant to be for a long period of time. You should always be active. It might not be 
those specific rehabilitative exercises, but it should transition into something different, like, you know, strength training, just general exercise and strength training, something they may not have been able to do because of the injury they or painful event they were having. Um, so yeah, it's very important. I always tell my patients like, well, you know, if you have type one diabetes, for example, you start taking medication for that, you're not going to just stop taking the medication because your um, numbers are looking good. So um, I always give that like, you, you, this is your dose, this is your medicine, um, exercise is medicine. And so yeah, it's very important to stick to that program. And I know that gets tough for people, but uh, they do notice. I know some people, oh, they'll come back in. I'm sorry, I had to come back. Um, I'm not feeling I, this issue we had solved came back and I said, well, did you stay with your routine? No, I did not. I knew I should have. So um, it's, it's, it's a tool for them. You know, it's, it's a way for them to stay, stay out of my office, which is good for them. Um, and so, yes, it's very important to follow through with those things. Sure. You do a lot of dry needling. Can you explain what that is and who might be a good candidate? I do. So I was certified in dry needling, oh gosh, 2017, I think. Um, dry needling was something that we got in our practice act um, in Kansas just, I think it was 2016, 2017. Um, it was something that was new to me. I didn't understand a lot of it. I had heard about it. I knew um, legislatively we were trying to get that written into our practice act. And so we actually did. And so I thought, I, this sounds really interesting. I want to be on the forefront of this. Um, so I took some training. I got hooked immediately because I was seeing some phenomenal results with my clients. Otherwise, I was treating at that time. And then I've gone on and done two other courses for needling, but I use it every single day. Um, and so what dry needling is, is we use, I should have brought one to show you, um, we use a small monofilament needle. It's very similar to what an acupuncturist might use. Uh, it's a small needle. There is no hollow tip in it at all. So that's why it's called dry needling because there's nothing injected. It's literally just a needle. And they're almost small. I would say they're about the same like width of like a um, like fishing line perhaps. They are so tiny. Um, and so the perception of the skin is very minimal. You don't really feel that needle going into the skin. And so the whole idea behind dry needling is to reduce the inflammation of our nervous system and to downregulate our nervous system. And so when I see clients in my office, one of my main goals for them, especially if they're having a lot of heightened neural response, meaning that they're in a painful event, your body has this response that kind of turns on protective mechanisms. So um, we get tightness, tension in our upper traps and our neck because something is irritated. And so our body and brain and our nerves tell our muscles to tighten up and protect us. That happens with most uh, chronic injuries uh, as well as acute injuries too. But if our nervous system is irritated, we oftentimes are in stuck in a chronic pain situation. The dry needling is very unique because it can kind of downregulate that nervous system and get the muscles to communicate better with the nerves so they're functioning more appropriately. They're not stuck in this constant spasm or tension um, or protective spasm that we have been experiencing that's been causing the painful event. Um, so by using the dry needling, we insert it, we do a full um, examination assessment, part of my evaluation, and we check the nerves, we check the function. What I do specifically is called functional dry needling. Um, that type of dry needling is based upon checking the nerve myotomes, your function of your nerves, um, how your nerves tolerate, stre tolerate stretch. And it's a really nice assessment tool because it tells me exactly where I need to treat. And so based upon that test, I will go to the specific areas of interest, the muscles I've found to be um, involved, and we and we do needle those muscles. And so when we needle the muscle, um, what happens is a reflex of the spinal cord happens. So the muscles kind of jump and twitch, like if I took a hammer and hit your knee, that kneecap reflex, that's essentially what's happening. It's a reflex of your spinal cord, and it basically turns off that nervous system response. It downregulates the nervous system. So it's kind of like I always tell my patients for a lay term, you know, if your cell phone's kind of being weird and it's kind of glitchy, you like turn it off and turn it back on. That's kind of what we're doing to your central nervous system and your brain and your nerves. So we're just kind of either um, resetting things, basically kind of a reset of the neural circuitry, but also it kind of downregulates the muscles that are overactive and it gets the muscles that are not working appropriately to be more active and to be more functional. And so it's a really great way to jumpstart someone's healing. And then at that point, it's very important to do exercise to maintain that. And I like doing the dry needling before I give someone the home program if I'm finding those faults when I do my exam, because then they can go home and do the exercises more efficiently. So, you know, maybe their glute muscle wasn't firing, we'll dry needle and we find, okay, now it's active. Now we're going to strengthen it so it maintains and we can prevent from having recurrence. So that's essentially what dry needling does. Um, 
it's a really awesome tool to use and I absolutely love it and seen some very wonderful resort, results with many different conditions that I really had challenges fixing prior to um, utilizing that as a tool. Very interesting. You mentioned acupuncture. Uh -huh. So why dry needling versus acupuncture? Right. So there's also a lot of confusion in between, you know, is it acupuncture? Is it dry needling? There is a little overlap. The only overlap really is that acupuncturists can practice dry needling as well. So can chiropractors, um, nurse practitioners. There's a lot of other medical fields that can do dry needling. Um, and so the difference between acupuncture and dry needling is, is very broad, very different. Um, uh, acupuncture is Eastern-based medicine, whereas uh, dry needling is a Western-based medicine. Um, so I don't know much about Eastern-based medicine because I've been trained in it. They take many, many, many hours of training to do acupuncture. And they're treating more of an energy field and those sorts of things where we're actually treating like that muscle and targeting a specific uh, neuromuscular response. So it's pretty different. But I do have clients that say when I do dry needle them, oh, I've had this done before by an acupuncturist. I said they were doing dry needling to you, not acupuncture. So it's a little different. Sure. Okay. Now, I had one more question about uh, sure. the dry needling. Um, I'm, you know, uh, some people uh, might think that, um, well, I, I, I might just, I might, I might <laughs> go, yeah. I, I guess I, my question was, if somebody is a little nervous about right. needles sure. or has a fear of needles, of what would you say to them? Right. So I, I have, pe this happened to me today. I have a lady who comes to see me often and she um, always is like, I've tried to tell so many people to come and see you and they just can't imagine ever having that done to them. And I understand that I don't like having needles poked in my body either. Um, but when I do have somebody that I evaluate and I feel that it would really benefit them, I give them a lot of information and just really give them basically what I told you, um, what it's going to do, what it, we're trying to achieve, and basically tell them it's it's really quick. It doesn't hurt. Um, again, you don't really feel the needle going into the skin. It's more... Um, of just kind of a cramp when we hit that muscle of interest and the body kind of like twitches a little bit and that's it and we're done. So it's really quick. Um, but you know, obviously if someone is completely, uh, that's the first thing I ask people, are you afraid of needles? And most will say, well, no, if some say yes, um, I will go into further detail and say, okay, well, here's what I'm suggesting. If it's not, it's totally up to you if we do this. So, um, but I find that people who don't love it do and do let me do it to them, find the benefit in it, and they do come back and see me again, even though they don't really enjoy having it done. But mm -hmm. I'd say 90% of people, it doesn't bother. I have people that absolutely love it, and they uh, I call them my little needling addicts. They they can't, yeah, because it's very, it's very helpful for them to manage their pain. Excellent. Okay, how do you approach fitness and health programming for groups as you do individuals? Good question. So, for example, like when we're evaluating a patient, when I'm evaluating a patient um, and giving them specific exercises for, I've gone through a full assessment. I know where their strengths lie. I know where their weaknesses lie. I've treated them with some other modalities. And then I give them exercises specifically targeting that issue. When I'm in a group setting, we do group fitness classes. And so I haven't specifically, sometimes, um, I haven't specifically evaluated all of those people. So I kind of shift from a physical therapy hat to more of a wellness hat. Um, so I take off my PT hat. Um, I'm not treating them as patients. Uh, they are just fitness participants. And obviously, they sign a waiver for that sort of thing. Um, but you know, I can't ever really, I say I take my hat off, but I can't. So I'm very involved in helping, um, to coordinate, you know, strength training to target specific muscle groups. So it's more of a strength training at that point programming versus like what I would do for someone who's coming to me as a patient. Granted, many of the people who do attend my group fitness classes, um, have came to me with specific issues. And I know, you know, during class, if I happen to be working out with someone that I've seen, like, how is this issue? Hey, I want you to modify this exercise based upon, you know, what I'm seeing them uh, in the clinic side for. And so it's kind of nice to do both. And it is also nice because my group fitness um, classes are in my same area that my PT office is. And so if someone is like, oh man, this doesn't feel good to me. It's like, let's make an appointment. And that way I can just go through things a little bit more individualized with that client one-on-one -on -one to put my PT hat back on and really take a moment to say, okay, you're doing this completely wrong. Um, I didn't realize you were so weak here. Um, and maybe they don't have a problem. Maybe just they might even just want some help to prevent an injury, which is really, really important. And so that's where the group classes are very important. It's like making sure our form is maintained. We really educate our participants on 
how they can move more efficiently. You know, don't lift too heavy. You know, if you're fatiguing, then drop the weights down and just being safe and conscientious of that. So it does look quite different from the individualized side, but absolutely, I love both worlds. So it's been nice that I can blend that into my practice. That sounds wonderful. What are some examples of the best exercise a person can do? Um, walking is absolutely one of the most underrated exercises for individuals. So that is number one. Number two is strength training, just resistance training. Everybody needs to be strength training, especially as we age. Um, I am in my mid forties and I know a lot of females who are either in their from thirties to fifties. And we start just kind of having these interesting body changes. I've been very aware of it. And I also have a lot of my ladies that come to my fitness classes or clients that come to me and say, man, I'm just not feeling great. And, you know, coming with chronic injuries and these, I'm like, are you strength training? Well, no, I know I really should be. It's like, yes, you need to be strength training. Everybody needs to be strength training. Um, resistant training is so important to help with our bones as we age to reduce the loss of muscle mass as we age. That is something that's really detrimental to a lot of everyone, but females specifically, um, you know, after 40, we really start to lose a lot of muscle tissue. Um, and a lot of individuals struggle with weight gain at that point in their lives. And some of that can be help, um, helped by, you know, building muscle. Muscle does burn a lot of fat. So that's part of my coaching that I wanted to take that nutrition um, to help that as well with some of these ladies who are struggling with weight gain, um, you know, and they're, they're doing all the right things. And it's like, well, let's find another piece of that puzzle. And so we'll talk about the nutrition component a little bit later. But Strength training and walking are ideal. And if you can strength train at least three days a week, um, do it. But uh, the general consensus is 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise a week is what we should be doing um, as adults. Sure. And you mentioned nutrition. How important is nutrition as far as preventing or helping disease? Right. Pain? Very important. Let's talk about Very it. important. So 75% of your... Um, you know, what, what you do to help with either, you know, maintaining your weight or losing weight or getting weight, it's going to be nutrition. Um, I have a lot of people who come and say, you know, I've been working out consistently. I'm doing all this cardio, which is great. Um, they might be doing strength training, but they're still just not finding that they're losing weight. And nutrition is like 75% of that. So, you know, if you really dial that in, it's going to really make a huge impact. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that they just think, oh, I can just exercise, exercise all this weight off. And the nutrition is key, but not just for the fact of weight loss. It's more also for the effect of helping our bodies um, be less inflamed, um, having, you know, less risk of heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and just other GI issues, autoimmune diseases. And for me, it was really interesting to, um, I was struggling to help some of my clients, not struggling, but people I have seen for almost years at a time with the same chronic problems. And I'm just like, what is this underlying issue that's going on with them? That's not letting them get over this. You know, they've had the test, they've had blood work, everything looks good and they're still struggling with problems. And so I was like, I feel like nutrition is something that we're missing out on. So I went and got that certification last October and learned a lot. It was very wonderful and enlightening. And so it gives me the ability to help my patients know how to fuel their body appropriately for whatever activity is they're doing, whether they're strength training or, you know, trying to do a marathon, um, losing weight, just trying to get over migraines or inflammatory issues in their bodies. Um, help with our hormone balancing. So there's a lot of ways our nutrition can really help to um, kind of help heal and reduce a lot of other medical issues, which I was, I knew that existed, but I just was like, I've got to learn more about that. So it was very helpful. And I personally have used that too, once I've taken that course and changed my eating patterns a little bit, and I have felt so much better. So it's amazing how much food can impact us. It is fuel. You're not going to go put like terrible fuel in your car and expect it to run well, right? So um, food is fuel. So especially being appropriately nourished is very important. Sure. We have just a little bit of time left, but your protein is so important. Correct. Let's talk about right. what are so, good sources of protein. Yeah. So that goes along with the uh, loss of our muscles, muscle mass as we age. Protein is the building block for muscle. And so it's super important to make sure that we have ample protein, especially as we start getting older, um, to number one, build muscle, help us maintain muscle. And then also, I'm not talking like getting really bulky or anything like that. People think protein supplements are for people that want to body build. And yes, they use, utilize those. But just generally, I think especially being female, we don't eat enough protein. And so number one, helping us maintain or gain muscle mass. And the second thing is to help us keep full. 
Um, if we don't eat a lot of high protein or fiber in our diets, we are tending to be a little bit more hungry. If we're eating more refined carbs, those aren't really going to stick with us. It spikes our blood sugar, goes back down, and we are going back for more. Um, so having like 20 to 25 grams of protein per meal is very ideal and usually pretty achievable if you um, implement some strategies. Okay, great. We had a lot of great information that we covered tonight. Thank you again You're for welcome. being our guest on Doctors on Call, Dr. Amy Regal. Next time on Doctors on Call, we'll learn about Parkinson's support group. You can email questions to us for our next program. That address is doctors at shptv.org. Thank you for joining us for Doctors on Call. I'm Jenna Miller. presentation of Doctors on Call on Smoky Hills PBS is made possible in part by an underwriting grant from Russell Regional Hospital, experts, neighbors, friends. Our team at Smith County Memorial Hospital is always striving to exceed expectations of our patients and guests. Your family is our family.